This lecture is for module five, the director's job, interpretation, concept, and style. And I've rather pretentiously titled it, What is Real? Art, Theater, and Style. So what do you see here? What is this? Probably many of you said a pipe, which it certainly seems to be. But can any of you translate the French writing at the bottom of the image? It says, this is not a pipe. Well, what's that about? OK, so this is a painting by the French artist René Magritte. It's called The Treachery of Images. And he painted this in 1929. And he's kind of playing a joke on the viewer because even though this image really resembles a pipe, its shape, its color, its texture, all say pipe to us, it is of course just a picture of a pipe. You can't pick it up, you can't put it in your mouth, you can't smoke tobacco through it, so it's really not a pipe. It's somewhat realistic in that it resembles the real thing, but it's not real. And René Magritte himself, he said once of this painting, he said, ah, the famous pipe how people reproached me for it. And yet, could you stuff my pipe? No, it's just a representation, is it not? So if I had written on my picture, this is a pipe, I'd have been lying. This painting is really the crux of what I want to talk about with you today. All art is abstract. And the definition we're using here with abstract means separate from or withdrawn from reality because we're not doing the real thing itself. We are doing a representation of it. A painting of a flower is not a flower. A sculpture of a human being is not a human being, right? Because no matter how beautiful or meticulously something is drawn, painted, or acted, it's not the real thing itself. If I said to you all, draw a cat, and you drew a beautiful picture of a cat, it would still be missing a whole bunch of stuff that makes a real cat, a real cat, you know. It might look like a cat, but it doesn't have the cat's bones and muscles and nerves and atoms and electrical impulses that make up a cat and the soul of a cat, if you believe in such a thing, isn't there, right? You've just shown me the shell of a cat in pencil or crayon or whatever. So art by its nature is incomplete, distorted, simplified, or manipulated in some way. So what good artists do is they do their best to choose and control how their work is going to be departing from reality. And they're going to simplify or manipulate or exaggerate or distort or reimagine reality in order to make their art. So this is a little tricky of a concept to really talk about, especially in this distance learning mode. So let's look at some masterworks of art to see how some artists manipulate reality to create their art. This first image is Leonardo da Vinci's The Virgin and Child with Saint Anne and John the Baptist, and it was painted in 1499 to 1500. So tell me, what is realistic, right, resembling real life in this drawing, and what is abstract? Well, for starters, the figures look pretty realistic. We can see two women and two babies, or a baby and a toddler, and their facial features and their bodies and the clothes that they're wearing look the way we think human beings would look. So on that account, it's pretty realistic. But they are incomplete. If you look at the faces, they're very detailed. You know, the arm and the hand on the baby, pretty detailed, but you get down to the feet and they're just kind of sketched in or almost like ghost feet, not at all, right? So the realism throughout this drawing varies. Also, notice how few colors he used in this work of art, right? There's white, there's gray, there's some blue, there's some yellow. It's kind of conveying a sense of light and shadow and three-dimensional forms, but obviously our color palette in reality is not so restricted. So he has simplified the world in terms of its color in order to make this image. 
So this is a question I'm going to be asking you over and over today. Take a moment and ask yourself, what do you feel when you look at this image? What is going on and how do you think the artist's choices in giving you this rather abstract, although quasi-realistic, image impacts you as the viewer? What's your takeaway from this? Okay, here's another one. This is the Statue of David by Michelangelo Buonarroti from 1501 to 1504. It's pretty famous, you've probably seen it before. And I'm sure most of you are like, yeah, this is pretty realistic. I mean, it's much more detailed than that Da Vinci work, right? We can see very detailed musculature and tendons throughout the body. There's very precise anatomical correctness going on there. But you can even see like in the hand, the veins across the back of the hand, um, you know, the the tiny poking out of the collarbone at the top, the eyebrows, right? It's all very detailed and rather realistic. But let's look a little bit closer and check out some of these details. The hands and the feet on this sculpture are bigger than they would be in real life. Uh, and Michelangelo did this on purpose. He exaggerated the size of the hands and feet so that we get kind of the sense of a half-grown puppy when we look at this David, which Michelangelo did because he wanted to emphasize David's youth, that he's a young boy, he's not fully grown yet. Other features of abstraction here is if you look at the way his hair is curled, it's what we call stylized in that it's really not the way hair behaves, but it's kind of an artistic, almost geometrical representation of those curls. And of course, the color is abstract because this is marble and this is not the color of human flesh and hair and eyes. Moving on to another famous painting this is uh, Jan van Eyck's The Arnolfini Marriage, painted in 1434. And as you can see, there's lots of realistic detail in this painting, right? It's a pretty fully furnished room. The details on the figure's clothing is very finely done. The fur on the dog is very detailed. The planks in the floor and the wood grain are detailed. The light coming in from the window is behaving the way light would behave, blah, 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 right? It's almost cluttered in all of the detail that it has. So realistic, yes? Okay, but what Jan van Eyck did here is he kind of carefully chose some seemingly random items and placed them about the painting in such a way so that they have greater than normal meaning. For example, the dog placed in between this couple. It's supposed to be a symbol of fidelity. Um, if you look um, behind the male figure, um, kind of down left from his elbow, you can see a couple of oranges there. It's supposed to represent this couple's great wealth. Um, if you look at the chandelier over their head, there's a single candle lit um, on the side where the male figure is. Some people suggest that this is um, a symbol of the presence of God, that we're witnessing a marriage here. Um, even it's super tiny, but if you zoom in, you can see it on the bed frame at the back. There's a little tiny statuette, and that is the image of St. Margaret. She is the patron saint of childbirth. So it's sort of like wishing this couple um, health and fertility. So there's symbolism in here, even though these individual items and their arrangement is you know realistic in that it resembles everyday reality the artist is tweaking reality to send us messages okay this is Auguste Renoir's luncheon of the boating party from 1880 this is actually a detail um so you may be familiar with Renoir's work he was part of an artistic movement called impressionism so Renoir knew how to paint accurately, but he didn't want to do kind of a photorealistic painting like Jan van Eyck's painting in the last slide, right? That almost looks like a photograph. It's so close to reality in terms of getting all of those details so precise. Renoir wasn't interested in that. He wanted to give the viewer what he called an impression of the moment he captured. So 
he painted things kind of intentionally blurry and a little indistinct. So it's as if the viewer caught something out of the corner of your eye. So Impressionism was all about kind of the fleeting moment, the effect of shifting light and movement, what you're kind of capturing in a split second, and not at all concerned with rigid, precise photo realism. So they were rather emotional and kind of concerned with the transitoriness of life and art. You can maybe see this even more clearly in Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night in 1889, right? This is the impression he had of the night sky, you know, kind of on a hill above a village. You can see a large tree. You can see the steeple of a church. You can see the moon and the stars and maybe clouds or the wind, right, in the sky above. He is not at all trying to show you how the village really looks at this time of night, but hopefully you get a sense of what he might have been feeling when he was painting it. We move forward in time a little bit, and now we come to Pablo Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, painted in 1907. Again, Picasso knew how to paint things very realistically. He's deliberately choosing not to do so here. We're getting into expressionism here as an art movement. And so what he's doing is intentionally distorting the human figures in his painting. He's flattening their features. He's exaggerating some of their limbs. He's de-emphasizing other parts of their bodies. He's almost turning the bodies into geometric shapes kind of jumbled together. And he's even changing some of these women's faces into masks. He's deliberately dehumanizing the subject. He's hoping to get a response from the viewer. And a good question for you is, what is your response to this painting? Here's another example, Marcel Duchamp, Nude Descending a Staircase from 1912. Can you see a nude figure walking down a staircase? I think if you squint, you can. Right here, the human figure is even more distorted. It's just a jumble of flat overlapping shapes. You can't even really see a face. You can't really tell if this is male or female. But you can kind of get this sense of, of a leg kind of bending at the knee and then straightening as the figure goes down the stairs from top left to bottom right. You can kind of get the sense of like a butt in those kind of round shapes in the middle and a swinging arm, hopefully. So instead of, again, instead of an accurate human form, Duchamp is trying to capture the sense of a body in motion. And he's really taken out a lot of the color in this painting and taken out a lot of the kind of nuanced of curve and shape and light and shadow and given us a very abstract view. And he's showing us kind of several seconds of action at the same time on the same canvas. All right, then now we have Jackson Pollock's Autumn Rhythm painted in 1950. All right, can you see any people in this? Can you see any bowls of fruit? Can you see any landscapes? No, Pollock wasn't trying to recreate or represent people or objects or vistas. He was just trying to create a feeling. I don't know if autumn rhythm really means he was feeling something about autumn when he painted this or if he just painted it in the autumn, um, but he's just trying to capture a feeling of a moment. So. He's just splattering paint on this canvas in a few colors, just letting the paint do what the paint is going to do. And we fast forward about 30 years. We have Robert Maplethorpe's photograph, Agito, back in 1981. So after the last few slides, this really is a return to a more realistic style of art. Yes, this is a real person. They're presented as they are in realistic lighting. 
But even so, the artist is choosing what we can see and what we can't see. So there's still abstraction going on. He is selecting elements. So this kind of selectivity can create a powerful emotional response. We can't see Ajito's face. We can't even see his legs or his hands. We see his back and it's curved and turned away from us. And we can start to wonder, you know, what is this model thinking or feeling in this moment as they're posed here? So what does this very brief, incomplete history of art tour have to do with theater? Well, it has to do with interpretation because theater artists, just like painters and sculptors, are making art. We are not working in real life, but the kind of theater that we choose to do can be closer to or further from reality, depending on the style in which we choose to present it. So theater is all about making meaning of the human experience or a text, right? So we're creating meaning beyond the basic literal sense. We're trying to discover the artist, in this case, the playwright's intent. We're communicating new ideas. And we're telling a good story in a way that excites emotion. So returning to some of these thoughts that we discussed just last time in our director's lecture, now we're looking at style. I'm putting this slide in here from last time just to remind you of what we do with this information. Okay. So we can be representational in our style in that we are presenting a work of theater that appears and behaves a lot like real life, kind of as close to reality as we can get it. Realism is a particular style of theatrical production that attempts to faithfully recreate, quote, real life on the stage. We could also choose to deliberately depart from real life and use a more presentational style. So think of this as a continuum. On one end of the spectrum, we have realism, which is very representational, right? Appearing and behaving like real life as much as we can. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have kind of pure abstraction, where we are as far away from real life as we can get, very presentational. So when we're doing a representational style, we're trying to mimic real life, which means actors and characters will behave like, quote, real people, Costumes and scenery and other design elements will meticulously attempt to recreate something that looks like real life. Could even go so far as, you know, running water, people actually cooking food on stage, you know, setting a, a play in a real garden or real forest with, you know, real actual trees growing up out of the ground. In these kinds of productions, the actors are not going to acknowledge that the audience exists, but they are going to carry on as if they were living their lives and the audience isn't there. The thing is, though, we're never going to get to 100% realism, because if we did that in, like, Hamlet, everybody would get stabbed or poisoned at the end, and obviously that's not something we want to do. When we're dealing with presentationalism, we're choosing a production style that acknowledges there's kind of a fakeness here in theater. We're not going to be trying to depict, quote, real life. And designs, you know, scenery, costumes, lighting may be deliberately distorted or abstract. So what might that look like? Well, the actors might speak in poetry or song or they might rhyme or speak in some other natural unnatural way um the acting and action might appear disjointed or out of sequence or kind of not conforming to the laws of physics or society kind of like acting out a dream or presenting reality from the perspective of a disturbed mind where things don't necessarily make sense right Actors could break character, which means the actor is going to directly address the audience and kind of let us in on the fact that this is a play and not real. Scenery and costumes and other design elements are going to be deliberately different from reality. You know, it could be as simple as all of the costumes are in black and white, or the set is designed to look like a giant 
chessboard or the lighting and sound is going to be underscoring emotional moments instead of just kind of like natural ambient sounds like crickets or traffic, right? Think back to that video clip from Pirates of the Caribbean and the different musical underscoring there. That itself is an abstraction. Okay, so the next few slides are going to be images from different productions of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream from the last century. So something you need to know about this play is that much of the play takes place in an enchanted forest, which is ruled by fairies. And these fairies argue with each other. They have sex. They meddle in the lives of the human beings that wander through this forest. And they turn one guy into a donkey for fun. I hate to burst your bubble, but since fairies aren't real, what they and their enchanted forest looks like is open to interpretation. And there really can't be anything as a realistic fairy because fairies aren't real. Again, I apologize if that's news. So, but each of these productions had to make their own interpretations of the text and the characters. So I want you to look at each one carefully and ask yourself, what might the concept or the metaphor for each of these productions be? What do these fairies make you feel? And what does the forest look like in each of these productions? This is Herbert Beerbohm Trees, Midsummer from 1900. It's black and white. I wish I could find a colorized photo. But let me just start you off with this one, right? There's a whole bunch of fairies there all over that stage. And you can see lots and lots of images of trees and leaves and vines. And then in the background, what looks like the sky. So if this were in color, you could see how carefully painted the tree trunks and the leaves are to, to say kind of, you know, real trees, real leaves, real grass. And the backdrop is, you know, real sky. Um, but you can probably see that these trees and leaves and vines are two dimensional, right? They're, they're wooden, um, flat, vertical cutouts that have been placed on the stage to look as closely as real trees do, and you can see how they've done this with the lighting to kind of create this three-dimensional um, light and shadow pattern on them. And these fairies all have these kind of giant wings and gauzy gowns on that are probably shimmery pastel colors, and the whole effect is rather like a fairy tale and kind of romantic. In contrast, this is Peter Brooks' Midsummer from 1970 with the Royal Shakespeare Company. And what he did was instead of this really elaborate kind of fairy tale forest, he set the forest in this painted white box that is completely featureless. And instead of these gauzy pastel gowns and iridescent fairy wings, he's got them in these kind of pajama outfits. So it's a very different kind of forest. It's a very different kind of fairy he's got here. And in case you're curious, that guy lying down with the brown boots on and the brown nose, that's the guy who's been turned into a donkey. I don't actually know what production this is, so I apologize that it's not sourced, but this is obviously a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. These are all the fairies, and there's the guy that's been turned into a donkey. If you look at this, this is set in a real forest. Those are actual trees. And if you look at that donkey's head, someone took a lot of time to try to make it look as realistic as a donkey's head could be. But obviously it's on the head of a human person. And you can see the human's head peeking out kind of underneath the eye. But also look at these fairies and how they are dressed. And you know what does it mean to be a fairy in this world? This is what this company's interpretation of forest was here. Instead of real trees, we've got these steely, metallic, you know, set on a slant poles that they're sliding up and down. And the fairies themselves are dressed in a very steely, cold palette as well. So what do you make of this? 
here's another production and here are some two fairies hanging out in their forest. So what do you make of these fairies? How do you feel about them and what do you think of their forest? And here's another example of the fairy king and fairy queen. What's going on here? So you can see with each of these examples from A Midsummer Night's Dream, they have played with different levels of abstraction, different levels of realism, and very different takes on what it means to be a fairy and what it means to be a forest. So why don't we just go for realism all the time? Why do we ever choose abstraction? Well, sometimes the truth isn't enough. Sometimes we can kind of reach the truth better through a metaphor. Sometimes reality is too small or too big or painful or personal to get the point across. And we're going to pay attention to something that is different or surprising. And also, we respond on a visceral kind of subconscious level to images and sounds. And so sometimes we can just kind of cut through the intellect with an image or a sound that really kind of speaks to our subconscious. So abstraction has a really important place in storytelling. If you've ever tried to explain a difficult concept to a small child, you would understand the importance of metaphor. This concludes the lecture for today's class. What you are going to do next is watch three short videos that are all about introducing lion cubs into the pride. I want you to pay careful attention to realism, abstraction, the choices that are being made in each of these three clips to tell this story, and pay attention to your own emotional response to each presentation. What do you learn from each one and what do you feel?